Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first lecture of CHY 113 for the spring 2021 semester. I sincerely hope that everyone had a great break and was refreshing. You were able to relax a little bit, I hope. Um, but now let's get ready to hit the ground running and study some chemistry. And so this first lecture, we're really going to just sort of talk about some of the, the basic fundamentals. Why are we here? Why are we studying chemistry? What is it? And, and what are some of the, the underlying principles of what it is that we're studying here? And so to answer the first question that some of you have probably asked several times by now, why are you here? Why do you even need to take chemistry? For those of you who, who maybe aren't continuing in science at all, or even those of you who, who are, but you're, you don't think that you're going to use chemistry, I really like to, to have this slide or, or show this slide here. To me, it, it really illustrates chemistry's role in the sciences, and it illustrates what drew me to chemistry to begin with. I, I went through several different things in my career path, but I eventually ended up at, at the UMaine Farmington studying environmental science. And as I got more into that subject, as I started taking a, a range of biology, chemistry, and geology courses, it really started to hit me how much chemistry was, was really at the heart of all of that. Chemistry is often called the central science for, for this very fact, because nearly all of science has chemistry at its very base. And, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Uh, but you can't study biology, for instance. You, you can't study cell structure without knowing what lipids are and how lipids are made up, what the properties of lipids are, how those properties give rise to the properties of cells, being able to be semi-permeable, allow some things through and some things not. What drives that? Why are only some things allowed through the cell membrane and how does that work? And, and knowing all of those, to, to know all of those things and to really know how that works, you need to have a knowledge of the underlying chemistry involved. Looking at geology and mineral formation, you, you need to know some basics of how atoms come together, know the basics of bonding to really understand how minerals are, are going to form to begin with and so forth. And, and, and really all science, the, the vast majority anyway, has chemistry at its very heart. And, and you have to have an underlying knowledge of chemistry to really be able to, to, to master some of the concepts in, in, in other courses and other subject areas. For those that maybe aren't going on ever in science, this might be the only science class that, that you ever take. What I where I still feel that chemistry provides something for you is you're going to, within the, the scope of this class, you're going to need to develop a set of problem solving and critical thinking skills in ways that you likely haven't before. You're, you're going to need to, to learn how to solve problems and learn how to uh, approach different problems and approach different thought processes in ways that your brain hasn't necessarily worked before. And in ways that I don't feel you can really learn in, in other subjects. I think personally, and I know I'm a little biased because I love this subject, but I personally feel that, that chemistry is unique in that way in, in helping to impart a certain set of problem solving and critical thinking skills, which will benefit you in whatever path you choose in life. And, and so that's sort of why we're here, why, why so many different majors take chemistry. To, and I haven't looked at the actual numbers for this semester, but out of what's probably about 100 students enrolled right now, less than 10 of those are actually probably chemistry majors. For, for the rest, we serve all sorts of other majors because there are so many people that are required to take chemistry for the reasons that I just talked about. And so that's just something to keep in mind as you're going through this semester and thinking to yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I here? I'm never gonna use this again. Even if you think you're not gonna use it again, you're, you're training your brain to work in different ways that I guarantee you are going to use again. So that's just something to keep in mind as you slog through some of the work that we're going to do this semester. And so moving on then to, to look at some of these essential ideas that we're going to talk about today. We'll talk about chemistry in general a little bit, what it is and the, the scientific method just a little bit. We'll talk about matter and how we classify matter into elements, compounds, and mixtures, things like that. 
And then we're going to talk a little bit about properties and changes and physical properties versus physical uh, versus chemical changes, physical and or sorry, physical and chemical properties, physical and chemical changes. And then finally, we'll wrap things up by talking about energy just a little bit. We won't get that much into energy now. Uh, we'll just give a little bit of a preview. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the scientific method. This is a subject that in general you've talked about a lot in high school science courses, for instance, maybe even some of your other science courses that, that you have started here at, uh, here at the university or in other universities. And so it, it's something that you've likely talked about a fair bit in other courses. I just, I really like to always start off my, my first lecture talking about the story of Alexander Fleming. It's just a great story for me that illustrates the scientific method at work and how science really sort of operates. And so back in the, the early 1900s, 1920s or so, Fleming, and I forget honestly what sort of scientist he technically was, biologist, chemist, might have even been a doctor, I, I really don't remember. But he had been doing some sort of work where he was growing bacteria and, and using bacteria in his studies. Now, I don't know if this is actually true or if this is just sort of part of the lore surrounding the story, but supposedly Fleming was a fairly sloppy person. The, the story kind of goes that, that he would just leave things sort of a mess and not really worry about the, the cleanliness of his lab. And so he was growing this bacteria in these Petri dishes and he went on vacation and left some of them, these dishes just out in his lab, just left them out. Didn't even worry about them, just took off and there they were. Comes back and just like if we went on vacation, left some bread out on the, on the counter, we're gonna come back and it's gonna be moldy. Same thing happened to Fleming came back and he saw that some of his dishes were contaminated with mold. Now, this to me is where it starts to illustrate uh, that Fleming was a great scientist because a lot of people might've looked at this and said, oh, my experiment got moldy, that's it, done, tossed it out and just started from scratch again. Fleming didn't do that. He looked at things and he made an observation. What he saw, we can see an example of it here. So here's a Petri dish. All these little spots down here, these are bacteria cultures. So these are just little spots of bacteria growing. Here's a spot of mold. And so his observation was that there was this area around the mold where there was a lot less bacteria, not much bacteria at all grew in the vicinity of where the mold was. And so again, he didn't just look at that and toss it out. He looked at that and he said, huh, that's weird something's going on there. Something is happening in this situation which causes there to be not much bacteria around the mold. And so he thought about that and he made a guess as to what he thought was going on. His guess was that the mold was secreting something. The mold was giving something off that was deadly to the bacteria. And so he designed an experiment or more, more than likely a series of experiments with, with all the typical thing, uh, aspects of an experiment that you've learned about, controls versus experimental groups and all that sort of stuff. So he designed an experiment to test what his guess was and he discovered that he was right. He discovered that absolutely, the mold is giving something off which is deadly to bacteria. You guys probably know what he discovered. Penicillin. Penicillin was literally discovered because some guy in a lab accidentally grew mold in his experiment. But more than that, he took off with it from there. He was curious. He said, why is this happening? He designed experiments to try to figure it out. And he really took his scientific mindset and put it to work. And so all of the things that Fleming did really illustrate for us the kind of the basic steps of the scientific method. He made an observation. He saw something was happening. He came up with a hypothesis, tried to explain that observation. From his hypothesis, he then set up an experiment with lots of control groups, experimental groups, and everything that goes along with that. He gathered data from his experiment, which he analyzed and interpreted. A lot of work probably went into that phase of, of his process. He, then he made some conclusions from that, and then he published his work. He got it out there. He told the world. And, and that's a, a key part of the scientific method that isn't may necessarily talked about enough. It's very important to publish your work, to, to tell people what you're doing. In Fleming's case, sure, penicillin probably would have been discovered in other ways eventually. But if he hadn't told the world when he did, 
and I'm horrible with history, but 1920s, well, World War One, what just ending or just ended somewhere around there, but World War Two, things were starting to, to ramp up. And, and I mean, picture just how, not even due to World Wars, picture how many people in the early 30s or so, early 1930s were saved due to penicillin. How many lives were saved due to penicillin? Because he got his work out there. In today's academic world, that means publishing in scientific journals, but it's the same thing. It's to get that information out there so that people can see it. Thinking in our current situation, the speed that we were able to develop a COVID vaccine was due to an incredible body of science that had already been out there and already been published. The, the fact that we knew so, that the scientists in general knew so much about messenger RNA and how it worked. The fact that we knew so much about spike proteins that are, that are on so many viruses. The fact that other scientists had done so much of this work over the last 50, 100 years or so and got it out there and published it so that it was, it was a body of knowledge that was known. That's what allowed us to develop this vaccine so quickly. And, and so that's a key and very important part of the scientific method is getting your, your knowledge and getting your information out there. And so let's move on to, to then looking at chemistry. What is actually chemistry all about? Chemistry at its heart, and, and the reason why chemistry is, is sort of the central science that touches on everything, chemistry is the study of matter. It's the study of stuff. Not, not only matter, but chemistry is the study of the changes that matter can undergo, the transformations of matter. The actual definition of matter is that matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. For some things, that, that's fairly obvious. Something like my pen. Okay, this pen, I could put this on a balance. It obviously has mass, and it obviously takes up space. Me, I have mass. I take up space. I'm made up of matter. The air in this room. So the air down here in, in my little basement dungeon where I record your videos, the air in this room, think about it. Do you think it's matter? It absolutely is. The air in this room has mass. I mean, well, first of all, it definitely takes up space. It's taking up the space in this room. But if, you're, if you think about if, if air has mass or not, take a balloon, find the mass of that balloon, find the weight of that balloon, blow it up, find the mass again, that mass has definitely increased. The air in that balloon has mass. So even though we can't see it, it's definitely still matter. Heat, think about heat, not matter. Heat is energy. Matter and energy are sort of two sides of the same coin, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Mass, so we said that in order for any, something to be matter, it has to have mass. Mass is a, is a measure of the amount of matter that an object contains. And so it is important to differentiate between mass and weight. Mass is a measure of the actual amount of matter in something, whereas weight is a measure of the gravitational attraction upon that mass. And so if I was to take a 50 pound, um, anything that, that weighs 50 pounds, or sorry, anything that has a mass of 50 kilograms, so I take the mass of that here on Earth, and I always forget what this conversion is. Just a sec, I'm gonna pause you for just a moment. Okay, and I'll do that from time to time in, in my videos. I will sometimes have to um, pause a video real quick in order to, to look something up. So you might see a little glitch in a video that comes up, um, but then I'll come right back. And so mass versus weight. So the, if I have something that, that weighs 50 pounds, we convert that over to kilograms. And we'll talk about the, how to convert things a little bit more in our next lecture. But something that weighs 50 pounds has a mass of roughly 22 and a half kilograms, more or less. If I was to take that thing then that weighs 50 pounds and take it to the moon, we're going to have the same amount of matter. So the amount of matter in that object has not changed. It's still going to have the same mass. It's still going to have a mass of roughly 22 and a half kilograms. But now the gravitational attraction is much less. It's only going to weigh roughly eight and a half pounds. And so there's our big difference between mass and weight. Mass is simply the amount of object that, that uh, um, sorry, the amount of matter that an object contains. 
weight is a measure of the gravitational attraction upon that object. So two very different types of measurements. You will quite often hear the terms used interchangeably. You'll, somebody will say, find the mass of something or find the weight of something. And for our purposes, and when you're, when you're in CHY 114 lab, for instance, realistically, the two terms can be used interchangeably because the gravitational attraction is not going to change. We're doing all of our experiments, believe it or not, right here on Earth, where, where the gravitational constant is going to remain the same. Um, but, I, but it is just good to always differentiate that there is a technical difference between those terms, even though you might hear them used interchangeably. And so matter, again, anything that has mass or takes up space, and we can classify matter in some different ways. We can either classify matter according to its actual physical state. Is it a solid, liquid, or a gas? Those are the three main states of matter. Or we can classify an element according to its actual chemical composition, element, compound, or mixture. And we'll talk about all of those. We'll first look at classifying matter according to, according to the states of matter. And so actually, let's go to the next slide real quick. We'll come back to that. And so states of matter, things that you're pretty familiar with at this point, the three main ones, solids, liquids, and gases. And, you know, this is something that, that you're familiar with, probably dating back to third grade science. You started learning about different phases of matter. We're gonna start thinking about things just a little bit differently on more of a molecular level and more about what these states of matter really mean. Much later in the semester, we'll talk about where these come from, why is something a solid liquid or a gas at certain temperature or pressure conditions, for instance. Um, but for now, we're going to look at them in, in some more basic terms and say that a solid, something that has a definite shape and a definite volume, and its particles have the lowest amount of kinetic energy. And so in other words, if I take, once again, if I take my pen, this pen, really no matter what I do to it, unless I put it through some really harsh conditions, but this pen is, is always going to have this shape. I can put this pen into a different container. If I was to drop my pen into my water bottle here, this pen is going to have the same shape. It's going to have the same volume. The water that's in this bottle, however, I don't know if you can hear that, but you can hear the water sloshing around in there. Water is a liquid, which means it'll have an indefinite shape. Liquids will take the shape of the container they're in. Okay, this is something that, that you know. This is nothing that, that's brand new information to you. We're just thinking about things a little bit differently. So a liquid will take the shape of the container that it's in, but its volume will stay the same. If I take 50 milliliters of water that, that are in a graduated cylinder, long, thin, graduated cylinder, and then I pour that 50 milliliters of water into a beaker, short, fat beaker, it's still going to be 50 milliliters, but now the water is going to be in the shape of the beaker. And the particles have sort of an intermediate energy, intermediate kinetic energy. Gases now, if we, if we warm something up so it's in the gas phase, now gases have an indefinite shape. Gases, again, will take the, the shape of their container. Gases also have an indefinite volume. Gases will always end up filling the, the container that they're in and taking up all the volume of whatever container they're in. And their particles have the highest rates of kinetic energy. And so let's just look at, 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 um, at a simulation of this. And so we can see, for instance, here, this would be a, a flask that has bromine. And you can't see it down here, but there's some bromine in the solid form. And we have some bromine in the liquid form at the, at the bottom here as well, and some gaseous bromine. Let's take a look at this demonstration here. I think I want this one. Here we go. This is what I want. So we're going to look at some water molecules. Right now we got water molecules in the solid phase. So we're, we're at 146 Kelvin. We'll talk about Kelvin and Celsius temperatures later in the semester, but 146 Kelvin, uh, that's like minus, about, about minus 130 or so Celsius. So pretty darn cold. So we're in the solid phase though, and you can see that the particles are still moving. And that's something that, that, you, might, that you may not be aware of depending on, on what you've had for science classes and so forth is that even in the solid phase, particles are still vibrating. They're, they're still moving on each other. You, you can't see it with the naked eye. Particles absolutely still have motion. They still have kinetic energy. But we can see that they're all pretty much locked into position. 
this particle right here, if we follow it, is always attached to this one and to this one. That's, that's really never changing. So they're pretty much locked to the particles that, that they're already hooked to and remaining pretty much in position. If we warm things up and get to liquid water, now we can see the particles have more energy and they're taking the shape of their container, see from a solid, see we can see that pretty much the solid is maintaining its shape. It's not, it's not expanding out to the sides of the container and it's not taking the shape of the container as opposed to the liquid absolutely now is taking the shape of its container, but still a definite volume. We see the particles are moving faster. They have a little bit more motion. Particle like this, this one here is sort of hooked here and here, but it's moving around a little bit. And, and so more, more energy, more kinetic energy, more range of motion, still maintaining its, its same volume, but the shape will be allowed to change. When we get to the gas phase, much more energy now, and the gas and the particles are taking this up the space of the entire container, and, and taking up the and so they're taking up the shape of the container and the volume of the container. And so these are all things that we need to be thinking about and thinking when we're thinking about the molecular level and looking at the various states of matter. The other way that we classify matter is according to its actual composition. And there are a couple different ways to, to think about this. But first we can separate matter into, is it a, what we call a mixture or is it a pure substance? One way to think about that distinction is, can this somehow be physically separated? Can whatever matter I'm looking at, can it be separated in some way? And so for instance, if I have, um, if I maybe just some um, sand and water, you know, I, took, I took a sample of water, I threw a bunch of sand in there. I can physically separate those. I can filter the sand out and I can then separate the sand from the water. So that's definitely a mixture of some sort versus I've got just the water. Can I separate the water? No, I can't really do anything physical to, to separate the water from, from itself. And then we go on even further with a mixture, is the composition uniform? And we'll look at some more examples of these, but is the composition of it uniform? If, if yes, then we call that a homogeneous mixture. If the composition is not uniform, that's a heterogeneous mixture. And so on the side of, if, if something can be physically separated, if it can't, and that's a pure substance, we break down pure substances into also two different types, either a compound or an element. And that distinction can be made by, can it be chemically decomposed? So again, with our, pure, with our water, if now I, I put the water through some chemical means, for instance, if I put water through something called electrolysis, I can actually separate the water into its, into its elements. I can separate it into the hydrogen and the oxygen. So that would make it a compound. If I have pure oxygen, now I can't break that down any further. I can't chemically decompose it that would be a pure element. And so that, that's a way to think about classifying matter into these, these distinctions, mixture, pure substance, homogeneous, heterogeneous mixtures, compound or element for pure substances. That's a way to think about them in terms of the ability to separate them. If we look at it in terms of the actual composition, it's the same, same distinctions, but we just sort of separate it into, and sorry, this one's flipped from, from the other flowchart, so sorry about that. But now we have our pure substances over here on the left. There's only one type of substance there. So picture maybe pure water or pure oxygen, just one type of a substance. If it's just one type of atom in there, if I have pure oxygen, if I have a pure gold bar, I'm lucky enough to have a pure gold bar, hypothetically, of course, um, you know, a pure lead bar, more likely the case. But it, so if it's just one type of atom in there, then that's an elemental substance. More than one type of atom, now we have a compound. So pure water, um, pure sugar, maybe glucose, something like that. A compound, the other way to think about a compound is it will have a distinct chemical formula. Chemical formula for water is H2O. Chemical formula for glucose, C6H12O6, and so on. If there's more than one type of substance present, then that's a mixture. And uniform, if it, the mixture has a uniform composition, it is homogeneous. 
If it has a non-uniform or irregular composition, it's heterogeneous. And we'll see some examples of that. And these are some slides here talking about what I just talked about, you know, that, that elements can't be converted into a simpler form by any sort of chemical means. Compounds are combinations of two or more elements. And just some examples of elements here. There are 118 total elements in the periodic table and so forth. We'll discuss the table more in, in later lectures. Various chemical compounds. So we have sodium and chlorine come together, and for instance, to make sodium chloride, sodium chloride being a chemical compound. Then we have our mixtures, our heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures. A heterogeneous mixture can quite often, like I mentioned, be separated by filtration. And so something like soil and water. Um, think about, for those of you in 114, you're gonna be talking about TSS in a little bit, total suspended solids. It's because the, the samples of river water were heterogeneous mixtures and the, the solids had to be filtered out. So we were able to separate them by filtration. This slide, I think, really brings it all home for you. It's so elemental would be the thing missing from here, but pure oxygen maybe over here. Well, there's something that's a pure substance that's a compound, so pure water, H2O. Nothing in this glass except for water with one distinct chemical formula. Now, if I make some lemonade from a powdered mix, now I have two separate substances in there, at least two. I've got water, and then I've got whatever substances are making up the, the lemonade mix. So many different substances, many different pure substances coming together to form a mixture. And this is homogenous because it's the same throughout the whole thing. So assuming that my lemonade is, is stirred properly, blah, 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 it, it, it has a uniform composition, making it a homogenous mixture versus lemonade from fresh squeezed lemons. Okay, now I've got a heterogeneous mixture. I, I, I've got a little bit here that doesn't really have any pulp in it. Little section here that has a lot of pulp in it. And, and so the, the, the composition is not uniform throughout the whole thing, making that a heterogeneous mixture. Mixtures generally, like, like I, I had mentioned, can be separated by their physical properties. And so we can separate things that are in different states of matter by filtration. So the, the, the water and the, the soil can be separated out by filtering. We can filter out different things, the, things that have different boiling points by something called distillation. So for instance, crude oil is filtered and, and turned into various forms of gasoline and diesel, kerosene, um, natural gas, asphalt, things like that are all have different boiling points and we separate those by distillation. Things that are magnetic versus not, we can use a magnet to separate those. And so there are many different physical properties that can be used in order to separate mixtures from each other. Chemical compounds, and so we're kind of skipping around talking about all these, these different types of, of classifications of matter. Chemical compounds are made up of either molecules or ions which are uh, terms that we'll define later on in the course. A molecule is the smallest compound of a, of a, a small, sorry, smallest unit of a compound that retains its chemical characteristics. And so in other words, when we say, when we use the term molecule, we're talking about one molecule of water, one unit of water, for instance, or one unit of glucose. Ionic compounds are described by what we call a formula unit. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll define some of these later on. We're just sort of hitting some of our key terms now. Whereas molecules are described by what we call a chemical formula. Various physical properties are characteristics which can be evaluated without actually changing the composition of a, of a material. And so for instance, I can find the color of, of a sample of matter without altering the matter, without altering what it is. I can find the density of the matter without altering what it is. I can, do, I can uh, measure the mass, I can measure the volume, and I can find the density. I can measure the melting point of something. I, I can take a sample of solid water, melt it, find what temperature it melts at, and it's still water. I haven't changed what it is. 
So I, I can find these physical properties without changing what, what the composition of the material actually is. And so we've got two different types of physical properties. We have what we call extensive properties or intensive properties. Extensive properties are properties which depend on the amount of substance that is present and they'll change depending on the amount of substance. Something like mass. Mass is definitely a physical property of, of substances, but it's a physical property that will be different depending on how much matter is actually present. Intensive properties, something like density, do not depend on how much there is. So one little thimble full of water will have the same exact density as a tub full of water. A thimble full of water will have the same exact boiling point that a tub full of water has. Both of those samples are going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. The actual temperature at which that happens is going to be the same. What will be different is, and we'll talk about this when we talk about energy later in the course, but what will be different is the amount of energy that has to be given in order to reach that temperature. But the actual temperature involved in order to melt something will be the same no matter how much of it you actually have. This is something that we'll talk about much later in the course, uh, but when we start looking at these physical properties, they're a function of what we call intermolecular forces. Uh, and so we will get into these in much greater detail later on in the course. But for instance, methane, natural gas, with its uh, chemical equation of CH4, versus water with its chemical equation of H2O, they're both roughly the same size, more or less. They weigh about the same amount. But methane will absolutely be a gas at 25 degrees C. Water will definitely be a liquid at 25 degrees C. So very different physical properties for something that, for, for two compounds that, that weigh about the same. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll talk about why that is when we talk about intermolecular forces, which will be actually one of the very last things that we talk about in the course. Uh, actually not gonna, some slides I just sort of skip through because there's nothing that, that I want to really get into detail on. Uh, chemical properties though. So physical properties we can measure without changing what the substance is. In order to measure a chemical property, we have to put something through a chemical reaction, which will change the, the nature of the substance, will change what the substance is. And so for instance, the ability of something to burn, the ability of it to combust is a chemical property. In order to find that out, we've got to burn it. And, and so we've got, if we take wood, and we react it with oxygen, we combust it, we burn it, we're going to then produce carbon dioxide, water, and heat. And so we, we've made something new. We've put something through a chemical change, but that was the only way that we could evaluate this, the, the flammability, the combustibility of this compound. And so in order to evaluate the chemical property, we had to change what the actual compound is. Chemical properties are really, that means that chemical properties are really just chemical changes. We're evaluating a chemical change. And the, the, the chemical properties will be related to periodic trends. So things that we see in the periodic table uh, and also molecular structure, which we'll talk about later in the class. Molecular formulas. So I mentioned earlier that a molecule is the smallest unit of a compound that still has the characteristics of that compound. And that composition is given by a chemical formula. This is something that you're all familiar with at this point. You know, for instance, that the chemical formula of water is H2O. Chemical formula of methane, you might not have known, but natural gas, CH4. Ammonia, NH3. Carbon dioxide, CO2 and so forth. Again, so these are things that you're probably familiar with from various science courses that you've taken before. And so that brings us to now looking at chemical and physical properties, or sorry, chemical and physical changes. A physical change, if a substance goes through a physical change, that does not change what the substance actually is. It's still the same thing, it's just in a different state of matter. And so for instance, if I take iron, solid iron, and I melt it in a blast furnace, I'm simply going from iron in a solid phase to iron in a liquid phase. I'm not actually changing what it is, it's still iron. If I melt an ice cube, I've got H2O as a solid, and I melt it down to become H2O as a liquid. 
it's still H2O. It hasn't actually changed what it is. That's a physical change. Chemical changes now involve an actual change in the chemical composition. And so if I, for instance, take some iron and I react it with oxygen, I'm going to now form a brand new compound called iron three oxide. For anyone that maybe owned 1980s era Subaru wagons, you formed a lot of iron oxide. Great cars, but oh my God, once they started to rust out, they just went. And it was because of this chemical change. The iron in the, in the frame and in the body reacted with oxygen and, and water. There's some other more detailed parts of this but we formed iron three oxide. We formed something brand new, chemical change. If I take, if I take uh, hydrogen gas and I react that together with oxygen gas, I can make water. And so two things that didn't exist before, we now have something brand new. Or sorry, we take two things and, and form something brand new that, didn't, that we didn't have before. If I take copper, pure copper metal, so, I mean, we all know the color of copper. And so maybe some of you, um, or maybe not, have asked, well, why is the Statue of Liberty green? I mean, you know that, that copper, that the Statue of Liberty is made of copper, but it doesn't look like copper. And so that's the reason for that is because copper goes through what we call an oxidation reaction over time, where pure copper metal reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere to form a new compound called copper two oxide. And that ends up glazing over, in the case of the Statue of Liberty, glazes over the Statue of Liberty. And so we have a green covering over Lady Liberty. Um, for those of you who are a little bit older, and if you've lived in, in Maine for a while, the Capitol building in Augusta, what, uh, the whole time that I was growing up, I grew up in the Augusta area. And when I grew up, the, Capitol, the dome of the Capitol building was green because it was, it was a copper covering a copper plating over it. And over time, that oxidized and turned green just like the Statue of Liberty. Around, when was it? Somewhere around 15 years or so ago, they replaced it. Or, or, and I'm not sure exactly what they did, if they just put a new copper covering over it or, or cleaned it up or what they did. Um, but it's now copper colored because they've replaced it with, with now just a, a copper covering over the dome. Uh, but again, the, the point, is that that's a chemical change that occurs, changing the pure copper metal reacts with oxygen to form a brand new compound. So it's a chemical change that occurs. And so if we think about just sort of chemical and physical changes in general, and we have some separation techniques, we can have something like, like chromatography, which separates components of a mixture. Those of you in 114, when we get to module five, towards the end of the semester, we'll be looking at chromatography. Uh, but the point is that we're undergoing a separation and we're not actually changing the nature of the substances. We're just separating them from each other. So that's a physical change. Uh, versus electrolysis, if I zap water with electricity, I can actually collect the hydrogen and the oxygen gas coming off that. And so I'm making something new, I, I'm, I'm taking water and breaking it down into hydrogen and oxygen. New elements that I didn't necessarily have before. So that's a chemical change. And so just sort of think about these and think about if these are chemical or physical changes. And then we'll just talk about them, but take, take a few minutes here, pause the video if you want. And I'll do a lot of this during lectures give examples and, and have you pause the video and think about things or do some problems. And then we'll come back to the video and talk about them. So go ahead and pause the video now and see if you think these are chemical or physical changes. Okay, for those of you that didn't actually pause the video, do that, pause it now and think about these. I'm on to you. Okay, so now hopefully you're back after actually doing that. So let's, let's go through these. Mulching leaves, physical change. We're not actually changing what it is. We're just taking the leaves, sending them through something for a mulcher to break them up into smaller bits. And so that's definitely a physical change. If I said decomposing leaves, now that's different. Now they're going through a decomposition process in which bacteria are getting in there and helping them break down into different compounds and different elements 
that would be a chemical change. But simply mulching them, we're just breaking them down into smaller bits, so that's just physical. Milk turning sour, definitely a chemical change there. there there's something happening in order to, uh, again, this would be probably a bacterial process, but to break down the milk and, and form new compounds, we've got the sugars reacting with things in there. We end up forming some carbon dioxide. If you leave it long enough, you'll build up carbon dioxide in, inside the, the jug of milk. So we have definitely a, a chemical change that's occurring there. Odor of mothballs. That's just something that's physical. We're not changing anything. The mothballs are just, just have a compound in them called naphthalene that then that compound comes up and, and interacts with our noses and hits various uh, sensors in our nose in order to trigger what we smell as mothballs. Ice melting, we've talked about this one, absolutely just a physical change there. It's still H2O. We're simply going from the solid phase to the liquid phase. And then we have the very, very, very sad tale of a beer going flat, physical change. The only the reason that a beer goes flat is because beers uh, and most, most all beers have carbon dioxide in there, have their carbonation. And so it goes flat because you leave it out for too long. And the, that carbon dioxide eventually just escapes out and, and leaves and, and heads up into the atmosphere. So it's just a physical change because we haven't made anything new. We, we've just separated the beer from the carbon dioxide. And so then lastly today, we're just gonna talk about energy just a little bit. Uh, and we're going to talk about energy a lot more. It's going to form the, a huge part of what we do in, I think it's unit two. Energy in general, we can classify as kinetic or potential. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Those of you who have taken physics or, or will be taking physics, we'll be talking a lot about kinetic versus potential energy and calculations with them. We're not going to do calculations with kinetic and potential energy. We're just going to look at what, what they are, excuse me, and what the differences are. Um, we're mostly going to think about kinetic energy, especially when we talk later in the semester about things like temperature, energy, the motion of particles. And so we look at, at kinetic energy in terms of the motion of things at the particle level. And so if we're looking, for instance, at temperature, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of particles. That's all that it is. And so if I'm in a room that is 62 degrees, the kinetic energy of the particles in that room, the average of the kinetic energy of the particles in that room is lower than the average kinetic energy of the particles in a room where it's 90 degrees. And that's all that temperature is. It's just that measure of the average kinetic energy of particles. Potential energy, several different types of potential energy. We have gravitational potential energy. And so something that is held at different heights will have different potential energies due to gravity energy stored in the spring and so forth. We are going to be looking at chemical energy later on. And that's the energy that's, that's just sort of inherently stored in molecules uh, or the energy that's associated with charged particles. We'll be looking at that a little bit. We're not going to really discuss nuclear energy as, as a portion of this course, but that's another type of potential energy. The energy that could hypothetically be released if we split an atom. And so that's the end of the potential for that energy is there once the atom is split. And so that's all for, for content for today's lecture. What I'm gonna do now is we're just gonna look at Chem 101 very briefly. So you can see some examples of, of what your homework is going to look like. And I'm going to do, for instance, let's pull up homework one. And let's just look at a couple of the questions that you're going to have. So for instance here, and so this is question six in your homework. For those of you that have actually watched the, the whole lecture so far, you're gonna get a couple homework answers. So that's good news. And so we wanna look at this picture here and try to determine what we're actually looking at, what, what type of matter, what matter classification that we see. And you can see that we're combining here. We wanna think about both the state of matter and the composition of it. And so first, we can see that all of these particles are evenly dispersed throughout our container. And there's really no definite shape and there's no definite volume. They're just completely dispersed throughout the container. So that's a pretty good clue that we're looking at something gaseous. 
So we're either looking at a gaseous mixture, compound, or a gaseous element. And we can see that these are all composed of red things and blue things. And in most of these depictions, the different red and blues are going to represent different elements. And so we can see that it's not simply a gaseous element because we have more than one color. And so the question is, are we looking at a compound or a mixture? And so here we'd say that we're looking at a compound because each of these, the blue and our, our red, are all connected to each other. If we saw blues and reds, and then we saw maybe some greens thrown in here too, we saw a different color, then that would be a mixture because we, we would have more than one substance with different chemical formulas, different chemical makeups. But here we just have a number of different distinct molecules that we would say all have the same chemical formula. And so that tells us that this is a gaseous compound. Let's see if we're right. Sure enough, we're correct. Chem 101 gives us some good solution feedback. When we get right answers, it should be set up as well so that if you get all of your, you go through all of your attempts and you still have the question wrong, you should still see this feedback. I believe I have things set up that way. But it tells us here that the pictures, this, the picture is best described as a gaseous compound. Gases fill their containers with a low density of particles. Compounds contain two different elements shown here in different colors, chemically bound, shown by the atoms overlapping each other. So that gives you a clue of sort of what you want to look for in some of these, these Chem 101 questions. Let's also just take a peek here at question nine. We want to know which one of these is a chemical change, either cooking an egg, mixing oil and water, tearing some paper, or watching a DVD. And so what we have to think about here, if we're evaluating versus chemical or physical change, we have to think about, are we actually forming a new substance? If we are not forming anything new, that's a physical change. If we do form something new, that's a chemical change. And so cooking an egg. That one might not be quite as intuitive for you, um, but if you think about sort of what happens to an egg and what it goes through, that is definitely a chemical change. As, as we heat the egg up, the, the compounds that make up an egg go through some changes and make other compounds. Now, even if you couldn't necessarily, even if you didn't necessarily know that, let's go through the others, because hopefully you'll see that those are all physical changes. Mixing oil and water. I'm not making anything new. I'm just mixing two things together. And so that's definitely just a, a physical change. If I tear a piece of paper, here I'll tear up the little, I'll tear up my lab note. Get it? Yeah. But my, my lab note, which tells me that I was going to go through questions six and nine for you, still just a piece of paper. It's just two different pieces now. I haven't made anything new. So that's definitely a physical change. Watching a DVD, my God, and I'm aging myself here with this question, but do how many of you even have DVDs anymore? Hopefully you all still know what they are. Um, but God, I know the actual watching of them, probably not a lot. But obviously we're not making anything new. We're, we're just using the physical properties of the DVD in order to display the latest Star Wars movie, perhaps. Uh, and so all three of those, B, C, and D, definitely just physical changes leaving us with A as our chemical change. Sure enough, a chemical change results in the formation of a new substance with a different composition and properties. A physical change results in a change to the physical properties of a substance, but it still remains the same substance with the same composition. Cooking an egg is a chemical change. And so those are a couple examples using what we have talked about today. And so that is all for today's lecture. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. See you next time.